think I am the digital scholarship librarian at McMaster University. Uh, when I, if anyone's seen me give talks before, I tend to pace around like a caged lion and having to be stuck at this podium. It, it's fine. I'm just going to be a little antsy. Like I'll, I'll want to move and I won't move. And so I'm sorry if I look uh, odd. Also, my nose has started bleeding. And that's why I have a, I, this is a very inauspicious start to this talk. I'm very surprised. <laughs> I'll get through and then it'll be over and then it'll be great. Okay. Yes. Oh, all right. All right. Aha. Now, now you will all witness. Okay. Uh, so, Digital Scholars Library in McMaster University. I start with a series of uh, disclaimers on this. Uh, I start with a series of disclaimers in almost every talk I give, but I'm going to do it this time, especially because it's on a topic that I am both nascently familiar with, which is okay because everybody is. And also, uh, I feel like a charlatan in a lot of ways. So it's a, it's a, you know, basically, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and things I don't address, and I want to be really specific about this. And the reason I don't address them is because we have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of expertise. I don't address copyright. I don't address pedagogical implications of this technology, including academic integrity. I don't address ethics. I don't address truth. As you can see from my slide deck, I also don't address beauty. Or the state of the world prior to June 12th, 2017. Now that date does seem kind of arbitrary, but it isn't. These are really important concepts. And one thing I forgot to put on the slide, I'm really sorry, is labor. Labor is also a really important concept. You're dealing with language models and, and so-called artificial intelligence. And I forgot to put it on the slide, but I don't want to forget to say that. So labor as well. Why I say large language model, not AI. I don't think AI is a useful term with these because our definitions of what is intelligence are rooted in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And it's not a practical term. It's not a knowable term. You can make an argument that AI machines are Turing complete. Uh, and does that mean they're intelligent? Who knows? So I don't, I just forget the whole debate altogether. And I call them what they actually are, which are large language models. So about the year 2017, now I gave a version of this talk, which some folks might have seen uh, in May, in which I filled half of it with absolute malarkey about video games and randomness and Philip K. Dick and the I Ching and all that. And in the interests of time and putting out all the fun, I took that out. So we're starting in 2017. Uh, and this is a seminal paper that was made in 2017 called Attention is All You Need. And this paper, which I have tried to read, and have failed because I am a librarian with an English degree uh, is extremely formative. And basically everything that we're in today stems from this paper, which is about how to make new kinds of large language models. Large language models and small language models have existed for a really long period of time, but this is a revolutionary way to do them. So 2017 was the attention is all you need paper, like we just saw. In 2018, the Improving Language Understanding by Generative Pre-Training, and that's what the GPT and Chat GPT stands for. In 2020, language models are a few shot learners, which is what gave rise to GPT-3. In 2022, Instruct GPT and then Chat GPT. Instruct and Chat are two kinds of methodologies for interacting with language models. Uh, chat, of course, is the one that you all have seen, Instruct. Only, only nerds see that. And then 2023 is GPT-4. Now, almost everyone in this room is probably more familiar with chat GPT than I am. I think I've used it exactly once. Then it's decided it didn't like my phone number and didn't let me in again. Because I think you have to put a phone number and it did not like my phone number. It's like, okay, then I'm just not going to deal with you. Um, but my understanding is if you pay for chat GPT, you get four, which is a little more sophisticated than three or 3.5. So a nice picture of llamas. This happened in February of 2023, Facebook, for which most of us have a complicated relationship. They're actually quite good at releasing tools, mostly for Python around machine learning. Folks that do machine learning may be familiar with PyTorch, which is basically a Facebook product. So in February of 2023, they released a model to the academic community called Llama. 
That's capital L, capital L, small a, capital M, a, because they're making a little pun on large language models. Uh, and they tried to be very, very clever about it. What they did is they said, okay, if you're an academic, if you're a serious person, a serious academic, then please sign up on this form. We will give you the secret sauce about the models. And people are like, yes, we will obey these rules. Absolutely, of course. So a week later, maybe less than a week later, it was leaked. And everybody had access to these open source models after that. So this 2023 V1 accidentally sort of open source. July 2023, they made a version two, which is open source-ish. Uh, they put some restrictions on it that if you or I use it, we're never going to run into it. But if you are a company that has over 700 million users, then it becomes very difficult. And so the definition of open source is a little fuzzy with these. They're more open than chat and less open than Apache web server, for instance. So this immediate, and you remember, it was not even a year ago. Like, no, it was, no, it was November of 2022, right? The, that chat GPT came up and everything became great or terrible, depending on your viewpoint. But this immediate post-2017 frantic present is this syncretism between Google and OpenAI. Google, which is, of course, playing catch-up right now, and OpenAI, which we all know, and at some other extent, Meta, Facebook, and also other minor important players. Now I want to talk about the weather. I'm 50 years old, so I can dimly remember a time when weather prediction was not quite as ironclad as it is today. And if you stop and think about it, you go to like Weather Canada, you watch the Weather Channel, and so say, yes, in five days, we're going to have rain. And it, five days happens and rain happens. And how does that, how do they know guys are moving around, you know, weather, it's a very chaotic system. And they know because, this is the early weather prediction system, by the way, is a barometer. They know because they started using machines in the 50s and 60s to do weather modeling. And weather modeling is, okay, what are, the, what are the circumstances like now? How does that inform how they're going to be in the future? And that became more and more and more sophisticated. And now we have a world today where we can get advanced warning of hurricanes. We can get advanced warning when it's going to rain, when it's not going to rain, so we know to bring an umbrella. But you stop thinking it's a very, how is that possible? It's because they did all this modeling, and that's, Sort of right now in late 2023, language models are sort of midway between this extremely accurate weather modeling that hallucinates very rarely and beat up Martha. And in case you don't know what this is, this is an early Simpsons, I don't know, season, season seven, I don't know, where one of the characters has a Newton, an Apple Newton that shows you how old it is. And he's trying to do handwriting and recognition. And he says, make me a note to beat up Martin. And that's what it says, eat up Martha. So we're sort of midway in that range. So I want to talk a little bit about co important concepts with regards to large language models in GPT, and that is the idea of the context window and tokens, the idea of what is a few shot and no shot technique, what are parameters, what is training, and what is the prompt, aka programming for English majors. And when I did this talk and mentioned this before, not this talk, I did, it was a different talk, but I did mention programming English majors, and I, I have a creative writing degree, which is like having an English major of English majors. So I am, I am trying not to mock people too much without mocking myself. And the, ran, the idea of the random seed. So context window is a memory of a language model. Tokens are r words roughly, sometimes three quarters of a word, sometimes more than a word, that fill up that memory. And response from the language model, and these are all current language models, also take up tokens. That's why I believe, and indeed some folks that are really into ChatGPT can correct me, please, that if you keep talking to ChatGPT, eventually it will forget the things that you said 10 or 12 conversations ago, if you have a long continuing conversation with it. So this is sort of like, this is a still from the movie uh, Memento, where a fellow has extremely short-term memory. And he's constantly having to write things down to remember what he is doing and what he's doing. And so that's sort of how a large language model operates and that it sometimes needs to be continually reminded of the, of the topic of the talk. So tokens and context windows right now are big limiting factors in, in every, nearly every present day large language model. Um, if we're talking specific numbers, uh, I believe that uh, GPT-4, ChatGPT has like 8,000. If you do the web interface, if you do it through the API, it's like 32,000. That's roughly 
I want to say 8,000 is like 15 pages of a book, maybe. I'm not quite sure, but it's not a whole book, for instance. And 30,000 might be a whole short book. But every day is a new paper dealing some method to get millions of tokens in context. So who knows next week or tomorrow or in five minutes whether that'll still be the case. I've I've been in library technology for a really long time, and this is the fastest moving thing that I've ever been personally involved with. It's really quite staggering. So I'm going to talk a little about few shot and no shot. They are methods to teach on the fly a language model what to do. So a few shot is you giving it a few instructions and what kind of sentiment it is. Like we're doing sentiment analysis. Say, I hate it when my phone battery dies. You say, that's a negative sentiment. You say, my day has been great, positive. Here's an article. That's neutral. You don't know if it's good or bad. This presentation is going fantastic, positively optimistic. And no shot exactly what you think of is giving it no context, just asking a question. I think when most of us use chat GPT, generally speaking, we, we assume no shot because we're not sure that we need to teach it necessarily. So no shot usually works okay, but training usually done on text corpuses for what they call single modal language models. There are now multimodal language models that work on images and text and video and everything like that. But on, on the original models that we're using now, mostly text corpuses. The pile is one of them is 825 gigabytes github share gpt uh, uh, book three does anyone know what i mean by book three books three is a data set of many 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 in copyright texts uh that were used probably used to train uh chad gpt and other models uh and is a flagrant uh copyright violation if you talk to some folks it's really not a decided case but when you hear about authors suing uh, open AI, it's usually over book three. And other terms like reinforcement learning through human feedback. Now that is a dry term that seems neutral, but it refers to getting folks to view the output of a language model and saying, yes, this is a good response, this is a bad response. And this is where labor issues come in because it is done by disadvantaged folks for no very, very little money oftentimes. And it's a, a problem in a labor context. And I don't want to forget to mention that because that is a problem the larger a model is the more resources it takes to train or retrain so that's why people worry about their data being put into gpt4 and it's not worth the effort generally speaking for them to do that because it takes a lot of computing power and a lot of water and a lot of electricity to train or retrain the extremely large models so parameters or roughly correspond to how complex or how smart a model is. It's it's really very roughly. It's an extremely reductive way of referring to it, but it is it is a helpful reductive way of referring to it. So it definitely correlates though to the resources you need to run a model. Which is why GPT-4, which is probably, and we don't know for sure because it's very closed off, 1.7 trillion parameters, which is a lot of parameters. You can almost think of parameters as like neuronal connections. I don't know. It needs this. And this is not an actual picture of where ChatGPT operates probably, but this is a Microsoft Azure data center, which they do operate in. So it probably looks like something like this. They are piles and piles of machines, piles and piles of graphics processing units. They use an enormous amount of electricity. They use an enormous amount of coolant. Um, just a mess and you can run a 7 billion model which are basically the smallest usable models on this and this is in my apartment and i i realized after i took the picture it's just terrible look all this filth on my it's just awful so this is this is a machine I, I i'm very embarrassed but anyway this is a machine i inherited from my father uh it's an in, it's an intel nook which is their their little compact box uh it does not have any graphics discrete graphics it has 8 gigabytes of memory it can run an artificial intelligence slash large language model, not super fast, but it can run it in a usable fashion. And it doesn't take a gallon of water to run every time it asks it something, so that's an advantage. So the reason how I do this is through a program called Llama CPT. And Llama, you may, we've talked about earlier, is the, is the uh, Facebook name for their software. CPP stands for C++. And a, a guy in Bulgaria, this fella, G. Gurganov, figured out a way to make models much smaller than they are and runnable on non-thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars equipment. 
And if folks know me well, there's one really defining characteristic I have, and that is I'm an enormous cheap ass. Enormous. I'm the cheapest man ever. I took the train here, which is not cheap, but when I got on the train, I took, uh, I have uh, a pile of tortillas and dried refried beans, and that's what I eat because I'm so cheap. And so when I saw this, I was, of course, very excited. Cheap, yes, let me go. So Lama CP runs on quantized models, which is roughly a compression technique. And God, I hope I'm getting this right, English major. Roughly a compression technique that drastically cuts down the size and more crucially, the processing power needed to run a model on your own hardware. So Mistral's large language model, which is a very popular fully open source language model, is 15 gigabytes unquantized and pretty much requires a dedicated graphics unit to run really well. But the most extreme quantization, you get to three gigabytes and run on a smartphone. I've run the, the first Llama on my Pixel 7 smartphone and it gets hot, but it runs. As running LLM generally requires fitting an entire model in RAM, or if you're using a graphics unit, what they call VRAM, video RAM, getting things small is really, really helpful and makes things faster. But quantization is like lossy compression. It's like a JPEG from a TIFF. The smaller the model, the more trade-offs. So if you ever take like a, a thing, an image, and you compress and you compress and you compress and it gets kind of blocky, it's a similar thing. You lose a little bit of accuracy, depending on how much you compress it, you use a little, and, and on the larger, like three, the, 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 the extreme quantization is, is rare. People don't generally use that. The more normal quantization is what they call like five bit. And that is, uh, that's, you, the fidelity loss is quite negligible. So prompting is asking the right questions of a model. And this is, all, I'm sorry, this is my terminal window that I stretched to fit on this. So it's really, 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 uh, maybe not readable, but it says, I say, just think of a good name for my cat. And he goes, Whiskers. Okay. Fine. That's a good name for a cat, I guess. I don't know, it's kind of kind of pat. I don't know. A little simple. And then I said, okay, a chat between a human and the world's foremost cat namer, Bob. Bob's been naming cats for 15 years, and he's really good at it. So I say, hi, Bob. And he goes, oh, hello, blah, 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 blah. And I say, can you give me five perfect names? And I describe my cat a little bit. And then, you know, these are also not terribly creative. And again, it's a small model running, so you can excuse the fact that it's not super, super creative. But there are better names than just Whiskers, because he's like, okay, he loves sardines. And he seems to love alliteration, which, I don't know, it's a little cute, I guess. But So you say, Sardine, Sammy, Telly, Tom, Mischief, Maxwell, Orange, Ollie, Tabby, Teddy. Okay, all right. And that's the difference. Like, that's what they, when they talk about prompt engineering, and you read articles that say prompt engineering is $250,000 a year job, which, oh, okay, I, I'm in the wrong career, I guess. I don't know. Uh, that's what they mean. They mean how to craft a question to get more intelligible answers out of this black box. So there are roughly three ways to get new information into a model or to create a new model. And that is trained from scratch. I've done this. Very, on a very basic level, I took, uh, I think, 100 uh, kilobytes of Shakespeare sonnets. And I said, make a language model, train a language model, 100 kilobytes of Shakespeare sonnets. And it makes awful, awful, awful sonnets. But it does. It works. Like, that's one way of doing it. But this is a very, I don't even know how, probably 10 parameters. I don't know what it is, but very, very small model. Uh, you can do something that's called things like retrieval augmented generation. And that's where you have, let's say, a corpus of images or a corpus of PDFs or something that are sitting somewhere else. You put them in a database and you say, consult this database and then come up with answers related to the things in that database. So if ChatGPT, which I believe now does web searching, that's how it, that's how it does stuff. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna do a web search and I'm gonna try to collate the responses from this web search and then return the results from that. The advantage of doing this is that you cut down on hallucination enormously because it's still, it's consulting documents that are known and whole. So that's very useful. And also tuning on top of an existing model. And this is how you get new content or hallucinations, if you will. And so those are base three basic ways. And I could be missing some ways, but those are the three that I know. So why even do this? And by do this, not this presentation, which I'm questioning even now, but well, why even run models or try to make models yourself? Why not just use ChatGPT for everything? Running your own models on Mars hardware is or can be slow, slower than 
chat GPT, certainly. It can be more inaccurate depending on your specific goals for accuracy. It can be annoying. And I, I'm, what I mean by annoying is that you have to get software, you have to compile software, you have to know how to get and compile software. And if things burp or don't work or whatever, you have to know where to get models from, all this stuff. So it's a lot of knowledge that you have to incorporate that you don't necessarily have to incorporate when you just go to a website and type in a question. So it's annoying in that way. But why? The obvious is you have a privacy guarantee. I run something on my own machine. I can put my social insurance number in it. I don't, but I could. And I know for a fact it's not going up somewhere else because everything is local to me. And that's important to some folks. Environmental impact. I, I have not seen precise numbers about this, but there are estimations that every time somebody goes to ChatGPT, every time someone types in something, there's like a bottle of water's worth of water or coolant is used. It's an enormous, enormous amount of waste of water, an enormous amount of waste of electricity. There was a, an article in the journal Cell maybe oh, two or three days ago, maybe a little longer ago than that, where a guy estimated that by, I think in three years, uh, large language models, cloud-provided AI models will take up as much electricity as Sweden or the Netherlands or Argentina. An enormous amount of electricity doing this kind of stuff. And cost. Economics says there's such a thing as a lost leader. There's somebody who operates out the gate at offering a service for less than it costs to run to attempt you attempt to get you into their ecosystem so you can't get out. And GitHub, for instance, has GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot costs ten dollars a month, and is a sort of a a thing that sits in your your development environment and helps you code stuff. Uh, folks that were at the the very excellent uh, Hackfest uh, yesterday would have seen that. And costs ten dollars for you to run. It costs twenty dollars on average for them to service it to you, and people that use it constantly upwards of eighty or ninety dollars. At some point in the future, one of two things is going to happen. One, either things are going to get drastically more efficient, and the cost will come down to reflect the costs they're charging you, or they're going to start charging you a lot more money to do this kind of stuff. And they figure you're suckered in, so you're going to do it. But and this is the crux of my talk. A small model tuned with high quality information may be more effective than a huge generic model. If you take your 7B billion parameter model, you put all this stuff in it that you have of your own stuff, you'll probably get more intelligible and more reasonable and certainly less costly and less environmentally devastating responses out of it. So I'm gonna talk about possible applications for libraries, some of which I've done in a very mild sense uh, that it's still ongoing research and, and I wish I had something nice to present to you today live on that, but I don't really. So uh, chatbots trained on site-specific reference transactions. Mr. David Kemper had that idea. Is he's here, isn't he? Where is he? There he is. Uh, this is a really interesting idea and possibly and actually genuinely useful service, especially during off hours. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, our reference services, our virtual reference services are staffed at two or three in the morning, but this might be an, a nice way to get around that kind of thing if they're not. But con, there's privacy and hallucinations. I don't know even if you can get a big pile of reference transactions out of some reference transaction software. And then is there going to be data in there that you don't want out probably? So it, it would take a lot of vetting and a lot of cleaning. And of course, the whole notion of hallucinations is this problem as well. This is something I've been messing with a little bit. Programming specific models tuned with examples of mark records. It doesn't work very well. Uh, and I'm I'm not exactly sure why. I don't know if it's my incompetence or or mark being mark. I'm not quite sure. But pro is public data, in some cases, extremely public data. OCLC had a bit of a, a data breach recently that you may have read about, so that makes the data extremely public. Uh, cons, it's complex. Mark records, of course. Uh, me being a non-cataloger, I look at them and I'm like, okay. And maybe only useful for edge cases. The keynote today made a very good point that there is real value in a human attention to metadata description that cannot be effectively duplicated, I don't think, by a language model in the near or mid future. So 
maybe to get someone started on doing a thing, but not necessarily on crafting a create and a full creative mark record. And if it works, make catalogers mad. I'm afraid of catalogers and I'm afraid of archivists. They're terrified by archivists. Catalogers are mostly kind of scared by, and I don't want to anger either of them. So another application, which I'm going to show example of, is using a multimodal model. And by multimodal, I mean more than just text, more than one kind of thing. A, a, a multimodal model trained on images and text, so things like image descriptions of unique collections or OCR. I'm always, I always think that special collections is the heart of any library. And part of that is because they have things which cannot be easily duplicated elsewhere. And a lot of, uh, uh, and, and certainly at McMaster, we have an amazing, absolutely staggering special collections. Uh, just, I can't believe all the stuff that's down there. It's amazing. So it, there's could be a real use case in using that to do sort of image description, initial kind of OCR. I have a model that does this on my laptop. My laptop is not very powerful because again, I'm a cheap man. So it's not a very good one, but I do have some examples of it. Pro, public data, genuinely useful. Con would still need editing or vetting due to sometimes hilarious inaccuracies. So this is not my dog. I wish it was. The cute dog. Isn't that dog adorable? Look at that dog. Oh, oh I love dogs so much. Anyway, this is, <laughs> this is a friend of mine's dog uh, that I try to put the dog's picture in a lot of presentations. So it's just adorable. Gosh. So I ran it through this uh, this multimodal text description thing. Like, Please give me a description of what you see in this picture. And it did a pretty good job, right? Check this out. It says the image uh, features a brown and white dog, true. Big smile on its face, true. Dog is sitting on the grass, probably. Can't really see that. Mouth is open, wide open, showing its teeth. The dog appears to be enjoying itself and possibly playing or interacting with someone the scene is set outdoors, with the dog being the main focus of the image. Now, this is an extremely small model, and it got everything pretty much bang on. I'm really pleased with that. This is both a good example of very plain text and a good example of why we shouldn't let language models do things a lot of the time. A computer can never be held accountable. Therefore, a computer must never make a management decision. This, it, I, this is like an IBM, something out of an IBM manual or something like that. Uh, and you can see it's extremely plain text, very, very plain. A normal OCR system, absolutely no problem with this. But when I ran it through the same thing that did a really good job with the dog, the image is a handwritten page from book, likely a man over guide, maybe, discussing the importance of a computer business setting. The page is filled with text, no. Emphasizing the need for a computer to make management decisions, no. The text is written in a bold, capitalized style, okay. Making it easy to read, all right. The page is divided into sections, we used to focusing on a different aspect of the computer's role in management, no. Absolutely 100% not. Uh, and I would have thought this would be super, super, super simple. Um, but no, I'd say describe the image and they're like it, it editorialized in completely the wrong direction. So I would love to think of this as an OCR and it might get there at some point because there are a lot of fonts and handwriting. Uh, if anyone's ever dealt with German and tried to OCR fracture, good gravy. It's, uh, and it would be very, very helpful if there was a, a, a better way to OCR difficult text. But right now... Uh, that's my talk. I thank you for your kind attention. And especially uh, sticking with me as uh, as I rambled through this. Uh, any questions at all, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, does anyone want a mic? And I'll sit up at the pedestal. I'll let you get back to the pedestal. Don't run. <laughs> I'm already bleeding. It doesn't matter. <laughs> all right. What's up? I have a question. From your previous presentation, you mentioned that um, when sometimes when you ask a large language model a math question, yes, um, it will not answer the same way the second right. time because they put a random seed right. generating number. And I don't know whether this is a really difficult question or not. I have Probably. an easier question if it's if if it's this one. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Well, the spot. Why do they do that then? Why do they do what? The why do they why do they put a random if why do they add a seed to it? Uh, because if you didn't add a random seed, it would give the same response to every single question you asked. And sometimes maybe that's what you want, but most of the time it isn't. 
uh, because the questions might be wrong every single time. And there's an aspect to querying a language model I didn't address called temperature. There's lots of really weird, fanciful uh, names, and temperature refers to the amount of wackiness, essentially, <laughs> that you want it to engage with when you ask it a question. So, for instance, when I run that language, like the, the, the image analyzer, I want to do a minimum of wackiness. And so I turn the temperature way down. If I'm just foodling around with a language model and I want to be entertained, I might turn it way up. Uh, and yeah, the random seed will influence how a question is answered, and you don't want the question to be answered the same way each time, generally speaking. Anyway, do you have do you want to ask the easier question? I'm sorry, that was a terribly terrible answer. You can if you like. You don't have to. My easy question is: Do you think, um, as if people have like these little models and you ask the questions all the time, do you think we'll have like a, a just like early video games? We're gonna have like this sense of nostalgia. Yeah, I, I, we are at an like people make a lot of hay justifiably. Uh, like folks that do reference, I don't do reference. I I went to school to be a reference librarian. I miss doing reference, but my understanding is. Uh, a lot of times in reference, you'll get uh, a patron coming up and saying, I have these five references I couldn't find in, you know, in the journal, what's going on? And it turns out they asked ChatGPT, and it will just make it up. Like I've talked to my own models and said, give me five references that John Fink wrote on the safety of river boating in Louisiana in 1855. And of course, I've never written about that. And but those cheerfully spits out five references, including legitimate looking DOIs. <laughs> uh, and of course, they're cut completely, completely, completely wrong. Uh, and we're at the stage now where this kind of, like we, we make a lot of ha ha out of this, but we're at the stage now where these things won't get worse. They will get better. Uh, and it's, 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 these are not going to go away. And so it's, it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us to deal with it in a more intelligent manner. And I think, yeah, I think as things go on and things get more accurate, I'm sorry, who's someone who, I'm yammering a lot. Who's, who had a question? You're pointing at somebody. Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. I know that uh, it it keeps giving a new answer every time that we keep asking. Um, so your last line said, uh, don't let computer make the management decision. It is so true. Mm -hmm. So the more you keep asking, the more combinations of answers that come, even if it looks so legitimate to our eyes, let's say we pick that. So ultimately, I know that it is the human who has to make decisions, but these answers also, they look so legitimate, so close. So what is what is perfection then? What do we rely on? Good question. Um, ideally, you can let yourself be informed by the text you get, but your call should be your call. And and I'm not, I have no power to hire fire or management at all whatsoever. So this is me, you know, at the bottom rung of of influence in my organization saying this, you know, casually. But it's 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 no, it's not a lot different than reading a book and getting an idea out of a book. It's still incumbent upon you to act on that information honestly and ethically. So, but uh, saying a computer should do it is a way of removing responsibility for actions, and we shouldn't be doing that. That's sort of the point I was trying to get at with that. It's a kind of a weird or dumb question, probably. Uh, it's not but dumb. In the earlier days, or even today, when we look up something on Google, so in the same page, it gives like 10,000 options. So on, in the chat, GPT it probably gives one option or two, or two options. Again, if you question, it will give you one more and one more. So if you keep trying, uh, it keep gives uh, uh, several, several options. So compared to Google and and a tool like ChatGPT, do we see that ChatGPT will override Google at some point in time? Will Google see this as a threat? Well, they already have. Like, uh, they have their own AI system, which uh, is available in every single country in the globe except one. And I want you to guess which one it is. This one. Uh, so they have a thing called BART, which I think they have tried to integrate into their search options. I think that has largely been, uh, I, I think, with mixed results. And Microsoft itself also has them talking to ChatGPT to sort it, which I have not used, but I, I think the results are mixed as well. Uh, and again, early days, will it get better? Probably. Will it get worse? Probably not. I don't know how much better it will get, but I doubt it will get worse than it is right now. I don't know. But we run a real risk of, and I think Google's already started doing this, in overly promoting the AI-generated responses to search 
that are wrong or misleading and leaving the stuff that was their bread and butter for years and years, the actual search of web pages sort of as an also ran when they're trying to promote this very heavily. And I think that's to the detriment of information seekers. Like I don't, I wish they wouldn't do that, but all right. No. No. Yo, someone get that guy a microphone. Um, first of all, thanks, John, for this presentation. As always, wonderful. Um, I think at the very beginning, you said basically that um, generative AI is not all of machine learning. No. Uh, so we're spending this enormous amount of time on this amount of error around generative AI, what it's doing, what it's not doing, blah, blah, blah. Talk to us a little bit about the other parts of machine learning, which have been around for a long time and maybe are more appropriate for use in the kinds of setting. Uh, and my experience with the very, 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 very heavy duty machine learning stuff is, is fairly minimal. So I'm you may be much more experienced with this, but there are aspects of natural language processing and access of sentiment analysis. Uh, there's a way to do uh, topic modeling out of file compression. So basically, the same thing you use to zip up your files on a on a computer can also be used to divide topics in a corpus of text into multiple buckets. And that's a very exciting. Uh, what's very exciting about that, again, as a very cheap man, is that they it runs on your CPU extremely fast, faster than any language model could do the same task. And so there's yeah, there's machine learning is a, uh, a discipline that has existed probably since the '60s. Certainly, to prior to Eliza, certainly the the small language model Eliza, uh, and there's a whole ecosystem of it, of which I don't know very much. Does that answer your question? But there's a, a fair chunk of other stuff that you can do without even touching a language model, around classifications and, and natural language and stuff like that. Nope. Hi, John. Hi. Um. This was a really great presentation and you're welcome. And um, I actually recently attended this workshop that's taught by York's teaching commons on um, artificial intelligence in academic settings. And um, pretty much the first thing that came out of that discussion as I was like sitting in the background listening was, oh my God, the students are going to plagiarize. Oh my God, yeah. God, I'm dying. This is terrible. Like tell the students to, you know, set a fire to chat GPT. Let's critically remove like everything and make new assignments and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was fun to listen to. Uh, <laughs> and then another thing um, that came out of that discussion was, um, you know, they were having you know, chats and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, out of nowhere, it was like the teaching comms was saying, oh, well, the libraries are experts in this matter. <laughs> and we should talk to the libraries about this. And for context, folks, as far as I know, the only other people who know about a little bit about AI um, other than me is Chris Joseph in my institution. So um, that was problematic as well. And he's not currently teaching. So I am the teaching, like only like, librarian who has a teaching portfolio that is speaking to this. Um, so my way of like trying to circumvent these issues and assuaging people to like not freak out is to do exactly what you did and say, you know, if you don't give it the right prompt, it's gonna be stupid for lack of a better word. Um, and I like to say, you know, machines are encoded by human beings and human beings make certain mistakes and so we have to prompt them in the right way in order to do the thing that we want them to do so i guess my question is um how would you go about kind of calming down a nervous faculty member <laughs> now you may have noticed my slide i said i don't address pedagogical implications. yes yeah. so you put me on a little bit of a sorry no it's fine the there's it's it is such a minefield. Like there's a whole cottage industry of, of you know, auto detection tools. Someone wrote with AI. They don't work, or they work roughly on the same lines as a polygraph. That they might work forty percent of the time. But you run a real risk if you don't get that percentage up, up, up. That you're falsely implicating a student in in academic dishonesty that they may not have done. And so I don't have a good answer for that. I really don't. Uh, other than if you can try to craft your 
homework to not just be writing an essay kind of stuff. And which is awful. Like it's, I don't have an answer. I wish I did. There's no reliable, real reliable way. Like in image generators nowadays, if you play around with image generators of uh, most recent vintages, you'll often notice that extra fingers will happen on people. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, yes, you like fingers. Do you like eight fingers on a hand? Nine fingers. <laughs> And that is not a reliable tell, but but when you see it, you know the problem person probably doesn't have six or eight or seven or eight or nine or ten fingers on one hand. Uh, but there's no real equivalent in text necessarily, other than you can see something's a little stilted. Like you might have a hunch, but there's no real tell like the fingers thing. And even the fingers thing is a terrible thing because there are new image generators all the time, and I'm quite sure one of them will get fingers right all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, no real good answer. I'm sorry. Hi. But I did say don't ask me, so good. Hi, John. We have one question comes from the Zoom live feed oh. over on this side. Okay. This is an online question. Um, this is coming from Peter Binkley. Oh, he Peter would like Binkley. to see if you could say a little bit more about your personal use of a local LLM. And I think you mentioned on Mastodon that you were using it for journaling. How does that work? Yes. And so there's a notion in pro I'm a, first off, I'm going to say off, uh, Hey, I'm going to say Peter Binkley. Thank you very much. I, I really miss seeing you. You're a wonderful human being. And I wish you were here so I could answer this in person, but hi, hi, Peter Binkley. Um, there's a notion in programming called rubber ducking and I'm a terrible programmer. I'm going to put it right out there. Uh, but rubber ducking is, uh, a methodology in which you as a programmer, like I have a thorny problem. I'm going to explain it as basically as I can to this rubber duck I put on my desk. And in the process of explaining, I will get a better understanding of what my problem is. So it's a way to sort of talk through to an imaginary person what your problem is and what you might get out. And so that's essentially what I've been using the text-based language models for is, okay, I have this problem or I'm thinking of doing this. And I try to explain it as atomically and, and sort of helpfully as possible. And then I get either a helpful or non-helpful response. But even if I get a non-helpful response, it lets me sort of rethink my own thought processes. I did have a journaling thing for a while where I said, this is what I did during the day when you have commentary on it. And most, it wasn't that helpful. Mostly I did it so I'd force myself to journal. It was like, oh, I'll play with a new technology thing. That'll make me journal. And so it, it was helpful enough. It was interesting to get the commentary, but it, it wasn't a, something that was terribly actionable. It was just like, oh, I see you ate a bagel today. How was the bagel? Like, or something like that. You know, it's just that kind of simple stuff. I know Peter's been messing about with it too. So we was here to ask him what he was doing, but uh, maybe he can tell me later. Anyone else? We have time for one more. For sure. Um, can I ask a very uh, naive question? A very minute question? <laughs> naive question. Oh, naive question. You can try. Uh, so the issue of... of um... Uh, coming up with with hallucinations exactly. So it, it seems to be a big problem with uh, language models, those hallucinations. But at the same time, it feels like this is a problem that's easy to solve. Like we have access to databases of information, we have yeah. indexes, we have. So so I can't understand personally why this hasn't been fixed already. Like well, that there's a way to fact check. Yes, uh, and I did touch upon that. We're talking about uh, retrieval augmented generation. So that's a way to, to try to force a model to stick to a factual bucket of data that you have. And that works reasonably well. My own personal feelings is I love hallucinations. I love weird, messed up stuff. I can't, we're, we're in the, in my view, the sweet spot of this kind of generative AI and that there's so much goofy stuff that you can get out of it. That's all, you know, extra fingers and all that kind of stuff. And the textual equivalent of extra fingers that I'm really going to be sad in a year or so when we're all out of work and the answers are perfect. That's going to be really sad, but no, the, the way to really address that is to say, consult this database, consult this web search, and then try to mitigate it through that. So that, that I wouldn't say that solves hallucination problem, but it makes it less of a thing. Well, if that is the last question, then thank you very much for your kind attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you.